the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the podcast that floats down here. Tonight we're discussing part three, title, Grown Ups. Chapter number 10, chapter title, The Reunion. This episode was 56 pages long and 5.14% of the book. Luke, you have the recap. Waking up in Derry, Big Bill receives a call from Mike Hanlon. He learns there will be a reunion of, all of the remaining, remaining losers. losers. Then Yuris won't be making it. Bill calls a taxi and begins experiencing odd nostalgia while seeing Derry again for the first time since 1958. Some of the old landmarks are there. Derry Home Hospital, the Townhouse, the Standpipes in Memorial Park, and the Canal! Of course, the fucking canal is still here. Pardon my French if you're a religious man. The large town has grown into a decent-sized city, and much of old Derry was dwarfed by large banks, torn down, or covered up completely. The cabbie informs Bill that a fellow is trying to purchase the land of the old rail yard, but it's all tied up in the courts. Arriving at the Jade of the Orient, Bill sees that Mike has aged significantly, but they embrace and join the rest of the losers in the banquet room. The group of losers has assembled, and they quickly fall into old habits, inside jokes, and nickname usages. Bill notices how much of the losers has grown up. Many similarities exist to who they were as children, but suddenly they have changed. And hands go most noticeably. Without Stan being their seventh, a void is felt in the group. But Bill believes that it is the seventh, and it is here again in Derry. The group toasts to the losers and proceeds to eat and drink quite well. Ben tells his story of being bullied over his weight by students and the gym teacher, and his tenacity to lose the weight. Ben got mad, and Ben ran everywhere, eating only salad, and went out for the track tryout and blew the competition out of the water, rubbing it in the face of the gym teacher who responded with a roundhouse knocking Ben on his skinny ass. Forgive my French if you're a religious man. All right, so this is a this was a doozy of a chapter, uh, a lot to cover, a lot to go over. So we're gonna start kind of in the first part with uh, Bill Denborough gets a cab. Who'd like to start with their notes from this one here? I miss Walden books. Oh, <laughs> the random books. thought they were mentioning the mall and all the different stores in the mall, and I was like, oh, Walden books. I would spend <laughs> hours in there. That's all. Random thought. Yeah, how about bookstores <laughs> in general. But there's still like secondhand bookstores, but there really just aren't many. Barnes and Noble is holding strong. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. like the only one that's still around, though. I know. Yeah. All right, that that was my sidebar. <laughs> that's fair. Well, um, my feeling uh, first note I had was Bill's initial feeling that something other than Stan himself had gotten to Stan is telling. Uh, having his first instinct of a plane crash or something, he gets feeling it's coming for all of them. So it's kind of one of those like. Bill already knows pretty much they're fucked. They're they're screwed. Uh so he's just like, Okay, what got Stan? You know, what what happened to him? How did he get to him? How did it get to him? And Mike's like, We'll talk about it later. Even then it's like, damn, this must be bad. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I really read it that way, which I'm probably wrong on, but I, I didn't read it as he thought initially that it had gotten to Stan prior to the meeting. I thought he was kind of hoping it was a more natural, accidental thing, like a plane crash, that no one has any control over in any way, so that it doesn't give any more credence to, okay, this is legitimately all coming back. And I think it's just a different, you know, perspective on it, but um, it's it's an interesting difference, I think. See, and I kind of take it slightly different in that Bill would never consider taking his own life, so can't imagine somebody else doing it either. Like it's, it didn't even occur to him that it would have been suicide. You know what I mean? Like it's just not part of who he is. So why would it be part of who they were? Exactly. And I think from Bill's past, he might believe or remember Stan that he wouldn't put that on Stan. Like he wouldn't think Stan would take that way out. 
because I think it's mentioned in this one that Stan's the one that cut their hands and everything. So it was him that's that, been mentioned before. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was Stan that made the promise that hey, we have to come back and do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought it was really interesting how old Dairy is like hiding within this new Dairy. It's lurking there. If if you know what to look for, you'll still see it, but it's easy to miss because it's surrounded by all these big banks and new malls and mini malls and all of this the commercial enormous hospital right commercialization even you know dairy home hospital is still there but it's just so built up around it that unless you knew what it looked like before you would never realize oh well that's the old portion of the hospital necessarily and i've seen that in hospitals around here in st louis where you know like barnes jewish hospital i had a a project in the oldest part of the building and i'm like yeah this is really damn old mm-hmm. and then you walk like the next building over all attached you wouldn't know walking around it but it's completely different yeah. like it's you wouldn't realize it by walking it but looking at the building itself very different so i yeah. that, the one, facade, that one the facade of the building has made it you know seem like it's different but it's always got that deep inside kind of mm-hmm. like you know what they're seeing with there exactly it's making it nice and yeah but, but the core is yeah. still there yeah and that kind of goes with my kind of first big thought was that when mike called and said oh i set it up at jade of the orient and he's like oh why so far out and the idea that that's a safe zone it's because new. it's new it's not even new like built up around something old it's like way out there yeah, it's it's expansion new it's yes <laughs> yeah untouched so, unspoiled so it, it's it's not the territory of it necessarily mm-hmm. uh, luke you want to go with your next thought here? yeah I, I think the cabbie is hilarious pardon, pardon my french oh, yeah. if you're a religious pardon man french if you're a religious <laughs> yeah, I'm, i am a religious man well then go the, the fuck to, get out of my cabin go to church <laughs> 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 it's just so funny because and again the audiobook narrator yeah. does a phenomenal job with with this accent like this this northeastern accent with the the local accent, I should say. It really gives a lot of color to this character that's just oozing with color, I think, and it just really brings it to life. So yeah. shout out to the narrator on that one for sure. Uh, I, I need to look up his name because I can't remember. So, uh, I have it right here. Steven, uh, Steven Weber. They call him fun, Webby. <laughs> fun fact about Steven Weber. Not only was he in the 1980s and 90s sitcom um, Wings, Real? Oh, that's Stephen. Okay. Uh-huh. No, he also was in the Stephen King authorized version oh, of The Shining, Shining, the the t- made for TV mm-hmm. miniseries on ABC. Be- because um, Stephen King so much hated the Jack Nicholson version, he went and redid it yep. a few decades later, and Stephen Weber was the lead. That's right. So he has some strong. Yeah, King. Stephen King yeah. Guys. I would bet he's probably been in another Stephen King movie because. One would assume. I, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen him in another one, but I can't think of it. Um, my last note was uh, the cabbie thinking the standpipe was uh, haunted as a kid and Bill just nodding it off, like not even thinking about it or not, you know, engaging him in that thought. I don't know if it was Bill like, yeah, it was fucking haunted or if it was more. Yeah, uh, yeah, it could have been or just not even thinking about it, just glancing. But I'm trying to remember the line of how it was said, but it was uh, more along the lines of just the cabbie. Because they were all kids around the same time, you know, seeing what basically Mike, you know, had just gone through in the same area and the other kid that got killed off the standpipe and all that. So I just thought it was a nice, interesting little side note from a, a non-main character seeing that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, for, for where we learn in this chapter, Derry is currently, like the current atmosphere around town, at least the way that Mike is portraying it. And maybe he's... Just so much more familiar with what's going on. He is a lot more perceptive to the feeling of the town. I'm surprised there wasn't more from the cabbie about like the current events, Yeah, if that makes sense, with nine kids being killed, which I know we're going to touch on here a little bit, but it just seems like the cabbie should have been more, I don't know, maybe that's just not the first conversation you have with somebody in a, on a cab ride, which is it's well, more realistic, potentially. Maybe dairy folk don't talk about it. Yeah. Maybe that's a dairy thing. Right. And that's why... I, I think Mike is just more perceptive to it because that's his role in this club exactly. is to know these things. So my only other thought on this section was as they were driving and Bill's remembering things, he comes up with Bowers and Huggins and Chris, and then he does the Wizard of Oz thing, oh, Bowers yeah. and Huggins oh, and Chris. Oh my. And it's so ominous 
it, the Wizard of Oz is such a huge part of our culture and has been since 1939 that you start saying the, you know, da 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 oh my, all of a sudden you're in a dark forest and you're scared and you've got that sort of dark feeling and you don't even have to say, oh, he was scared. Just putting it in there like that lets you know that this is such an uncomfortable thing he's walking towards as Dorothy was walking towards the Wicked Witch. So I liked that. Right along with that, too, I can't find the exact the exact line, but right around that portion where he's where Bill is remembering back to Bowers and and Huggins and Chris, he he kind of references how those three were continually driving the group together, even though they had no idea that they were doing it. So mm -hmm. it gives more credence to the thought that you gave me earlier on of do you feel like this group is being pulled and pulled and pulled together you know like is, is there another force that's like making sure that the this group is getting together and so it it's just kind of adding to that a little bit that overall sentiment of no one has a choice in this at all yeah like they're in and there's not a whole lot any of them can do aside from what stan has now done of washing your hands of it for lack of a better term no, that's completely fair. Uh, you know, and yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right with that mindset of Huggins and Chris and everything, uh, forcing them together, pushing them closer. And yeah, that's kind of where I was going with uh, earlier in the in our series of there's something bringing the losers together. I don't know if it's extra forces. I don't know if it's human forces, but there is something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you picking up on those three. That's pretty interesting. So we we do get to the restaurant and. Yeah. Uh, Bill finds Mike in the lobby and and uh, Mike looks way too old, you know, <laughs> and and even Mike's like, yeah, I know how I look in all these things. And I think Bill does a great job of kind of realizing Mike's put some sacrifices together to get everyone here. Yeah. And um, Derry's definitely wearing on Mike. But it seems like Bill gives him a little, you know, I think they kind of they kind of hug it out and. um Bill does his thing and kind of brings some confidence to the, well, we'll face it all together yeah. kind of mentality. Well, then we're going to move on to part two of this. Uh, Bill Denbro gets a look. They head into the private dining area where Bill gets to see the rest of the losers there. there. And uh, I'm going to start with mine because uh, that's a real realization of Bill had of, oh, shit, we got old. Or the simpler terms from Luke and I's other show. You got fat. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know. Unless you're Ben. Yeah, true. Yeah. That's, this is very true. But, yeah, it's one of those of uh, everybody's been there. If you're anything over the age of 25 where you see someone you haven't seen for 10 to 15 or 20 years. I'm like, damn, you're old. Damn, that means I'm old. <laughs> okay. Well, how have you been? <laughs> yeah. So. Except sometimes you see people and you're like, man, you don't look any different at all. Yeah. And I think he, ha Bill had a moment of that too, of like, these are exactly the same people. They don't look different even a little bit from mm -hmm. how I remember them until like he looked again and could see the oldness, if you will. But I do that sometimes. I'll run into somebody that I haven't seen in 20 years. I'm like, yeah, there you are. Hi. Oh, I look so bit. No, you don't. You look exactly like you did in high school. Yeah. yeah no, that instant recognition that he had when he first sees them he walks in he sees them and he almost thinks that he sees exactly who they were when they were little you know when they were kids he sees those exact same things even though some of those things aren't actually there you know like he, he even like imagines richie's glasses being there but they're not and so it, like it's just kind of a weird his mind playing tricks on him that hey these are those people it just takes your rain a second to kind of register they're not exactly the same as what they were it really did sound like an amazing meal uh, i have it written out here spare ribs mugu guy pan braised chicken wings egg rolls water chestnuts wrapped in bacon beef skewers and a flambéed baked alaska god kill me now my my colon would probably just quit in protest after that but that does sound like a great meal i want water chestnuts wrapped in bacon please <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like they were drinking quite a bit as well and not realizing it and not feeling much of the effects of it is something I noticed. That's the second time we've had a, a reference to something like that going on. I just find that interesting that whatever is going on with these people, normal rules don't quite apply to them Yeah, in certain ways. I in mean, this situation. Right. At least right now, since this has been going on, whatever this realization, fish scales off the eyes, them remembering things is going on. They almost seem invincible 
in certain ways or maybe not invincible, but untouchable in certain ways. So my last kind of thought in this section really pulls into that idea of, like you were saying, the different things going on with them and Bill's realization of it, because he does by the end of the chapter realize like something was them, something had to do with them. And he said um, it was something like it is here. It might be the seventh one in the room, even if Stan didn't make it there seven. And it was this part that was really interesting to me. And it says... And he felt suddenly that it was the seventh, that it and time were somehow interchangeable, that it were all their faces, as well as the thousand others with which it had terrified and killed. And the idea that it might be them was somehow the most frightening of all. How much of us was left behind here, he thought with a sudden rising terror. How much of us never left the drains and the sewers where it lived and where it fed? Is that why we forgot? Because part of us each never had any future, never grew, never left dairy. Is that why? The the line in the middle of that, that he thinks the fact that it could be us, you know, we could be it. That is the scariest part. And I agree with that. Like that, that was the line that reading through each time I've read through this chapter now stuck to me. I was like, you know, they're confused too. I mean, they're they're right where I'm at. I don't know where this is going, and they're not sure where it was, you know, 27 years ago, and they're being thrust into this again, but they know, well, we have to do this, and I don't know what that means, and they don't either. I just, I feel like I'm one of them right now. <laughs> Good, except, <laughs> you know, be careful. <laughs> I, I won't take any showers or anything. Stay away from the water and the, and the sewers. <laughs> So, all right, we're going to move to the part three of this chapter. Uh, ben Hanscom gets skinny. Can I just start by saying they really tell very nice versions of their lives at first, yeah. don't they? Oh, yeah. Like, Eddie's like, oh, yeah, I'm married. She's wonderful. And Beverly, too. I'm married to that. And her, her boring husband, Mr. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But doesn't Bill even kind of not believe her when she says that for the first like the, at first oh no because nobody is married to anybody that perfect yeah, no definitely he he's ca he calls it or doesn't call it out but he senses it and i think a little later on in the chapter he says oh now mr perfect mm -hmm. is uh now really showing uh -huh. th showing yeah. his true yep. colors Going on that, Ben, I, I love how they kind of all tell their stories and everything, and then they get to Ben. And Ben just sitting there quietly, his skinny little ass just sitting there. And Ben's story is so damn heartbreaking, but inspirational at the same time. You know, I've been in a close boat, and it hurts, and it's embarrassing, but you need that motivation to get you to that next level. So even though the coach was a piece of crap, what he did do to Ben is what he needed. You know, it, it's... It's a horrible, roundabout, crappy way to do it, but it's what Ben needed to get it through his head that you're fat up here before you're fat anywhere else. And Ben realized, you're right. I'm going to show you how right you are. I'm going to, you know, make you pay for it. And he did. And it's such a great story. But in the end, the coach really wasn't wrong. You know, it's kind of one of those, the gray areas. He's a dick, but... But being not wrong doesn't make it okay for the way he chose to... No, agreed. Agreed. It, yeah, th there, there could have been. I, mean, a, I agree with you. Better. Ben needed something, but there's a better way to be a mentor. Yeah. That guy was an ass. I like that when this is kind of going on and there's a pretty loud reaction to parts of Ben's story. And, you know, even Bev is like, you don't have to keep going on. But Bill is like, let him finish. Like Bill makes a decision. You have to let him get this out because he deserves that. He deserves to tell a story. And we deserve to know it because that's how close we are. And we need to get to that level quickly again. We need to get there as a team again. And, you know, he, he realizes you got mad when he decided to start losing the weight and all these things. And he did. And we've seen just, what, two chapters ago where Ben got mad and took out the three bullies almost single-handedly to get them all out of trouble. And it's it was kind of that bull rush technique of just see red and get out. And that's kind of what he did to get out of his own mental prison that he had put himself in or let himself be put in by his mother. And I think Ben kind of taking the power back for himself and kind of convincing his mom that, yeah, it's OK for whatever odd problems that she has, which are reasonable. I get them. But he found a constructive way of working through 
both of their needs in their relationship, if that makes sense. Because she yeah, needs to overfeed him. <laughs> she That's a, a need of hers. <laughs> and he found a productive way of letting her do that. Yeah. Just eat greens. Like, it's, I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. I feel bad for her. Why? I, I, you're all looking at me weird. Okay. No. It's, it's the mom thing, right? Like, she wants so badly to take care of her son and doesn't know how. We, we learned earlier on in the book that she doesn't know he didn't have friends. You know what I mean? Like, she doesn't relate to him really well. She doesn't, like he said, you know, she she wasn't, like, super smart. She didn't have a lot of experience, but she was willing to work really hard. She just knew she, she had, no had to take care. support either. No support either. Right. So she knew she just had to take care of her boy, but she didn't know how to do that other than to feed him. Because, and especially, like, and I'm kind of assuming she maybe was raised in poverty as well. Because one of the things that's hardest is... Am I going to eat? Do I get to eat? When's my next meal coming? You know, I have students who leave on Friday and don't eat again until they get breakfast Monday morning. So when do I eat? And if she was raised that way, the fact that she, as a woman alone in the 50s, can put food on that table, at least I can feed him. You know, I, I'm doing a good job because I can feed him and look at how healthy he looks. And this is in a time when being yeah. that overweight, like it looked bad, but it wasn't necessarily like this huge health thing that everybody that was as common as it is now. So I just, I feel sorry for her that that's her measure of success because then the fight with him, I can see her point of view. I don't agree with it because she's wrong and like, you know, dude, let him eat whatever, but she's losing that control over something she thought she was doing a good job with. The one thing she had done a good job with after having moved, after having had to live with the sister, all of that. And, all of a sudden, she wasn't good anymore. No, and that makes sense. And uh, I, I can understand. And I do kind of, like you said, feel for her because that's what she knows. Uh, but I'm proud of Ben for finally for standing up to her and saying, no, this is you know what I need. And then they do work it out and find that happy medium of feed me all you want. Just make it green. And I'm I'm not taking her side at all because I absolutely love Ben in that moment. But he does it in such a nice way. I mean, he said they fought about it, but at the end of the day, like, he found a way to do it without alienating her. Exactly. From his life. So, I, I don't know. I just really like him, and I'm glad that he respects his mom enough to, like, find a way to work with her. Right, yeah. It's the way that he found a way to have that, you know, them working together, found that middle ground. Mm -hmm. That's what I was really getting at early, because I, I agree with that. I, I think that was quite well done, regardless of if she's right or wrong or intentions that... Yeah, but I... Oh, she's I, wrong. I just understand well, I, that. Yeah, I was... I appreciate your sentiment that you have for feeling for her. I hadn't really thought about it in those ways, so I appreciate that. So, we want to talk about Stan? What they talk about him in this section? Or is there anything um, else on Ben's story? Well, not really. No, it's definitely after Ben's story, but, like, there's kind of this in-between talk. After after Ben finishes, they get another round of beers and all, you know, all these drinks and stuff, and... Bill is, you know, kind of talking to himself, you know, in his in his mental narrator and saying like, all right, anyone else start talking? Anyone else start talking? Let's, Richie, tell us about something. Bev, tell us about Mr. Perfect. Do not let Mike start talking <laughs> because once Mike starts talking, shit's going downhill. Like the door is officially sprung open on all of this being a real thing because none of them want that to happen. But it's already happened and it's going to keep happening. And I just think it's really interesting that the next thing that happens is Eddie's like, so what happened to Stan? Yeah, I'm, I had to look up the little line here and uh, basically. Uh, someone did. Eddie Kasprick did. It was not what Teddy Kennedy was like or how much Redford tipped or even why he had found it necessary to keep what Richie had sometimes called Eddie's lung sucker in the old days. He asked Mike when Stan Uris had died, the night before last, when I made the calls. And at that moment, I think it hit everybody, you know, they, especially Bill, because it's like, did it have anything to do with, with why her? And Mike goes on to, I could make the question and say he didn't leave a note, no one can be sure, but since it happened almost immediately after I <laughs> called him... I think the assumption is safe enough. That was a pretty safe <laughs> bet. <laughs> yeah, and Beverly calls it out. He killed himself, and it was nodded. And so, but I think at that moment, all of them were kind of like, Sh shit, okay, so this is real, and Stan knew. 
I have thoughts on Stan. We'll we'll get back to some of them in my predictions a- area. But I I like Stan. I think he's a very interesting character because you know so little about him. I think that's one thing that really stands out to me is we don't know anything about him because we've never been in his head. And it's really intriguing the way he's done that with one of the losers. It's supposed to be one of our main characters, but we haven't really been in his head except for him telling that one story, you know, a couple chapters ago. It was in the middle of Bev's chapter, right? We got his story, but it was a flashback, so it wasn't like a full, long-drawn sequence. But Stan liked things to be orderly, clean, couldn't handle getting dirty, and he couldn't handle getting dirty all over again. So he chose a clean way out. He didn't want to get involved again. I just, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings on Stan. (laughs) Okay. That I will get to at the end of this episode. All right. All right. Then we will move on to part four, the losers get the scoop. Uh, Basically, Mike gives a rundown of all the deaths and happenings in Derry that made him make the calls. I actually really didn't have any notes for this section. Oh, man, there was so much in this. I know, but I just... Oh, I, like, ran out of space. I did, so too. <laughs> go All at right. it. I will just kind of... All right, you want to start and... with your first one? Cause... I do. Yeah, I, I agree. Ben recognizing Harold Gardner's name. It wasn't Ben. No. He... no. I, Bill, sorry. Yeah. There you go. That's I better. I met Bill. <laughs> Well, now go on with your thought. Yeah, I just, I find that awesome. He's the only one that would know that, that it was Mike Gardner, who that, you know, was the one that brought Georgie's body back, bring my body back. Um, but I just thought that was interesting that he made the connection, the same connection that Benji threw out there in chapter one, <laughs> which I had no reference to. And I was like, oh, I guess it's not really a spoiler, but this name means something now. So be on the lookout for Gardner. And, so um, did you catch it like? Well, but when- then it was chapter two where, because uh, Mike Gardner was the one that found the body of, or dealt with uh, Webby and and all those guys for the uh, Harold Harold Gardner. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. the names are o- off- a lot Officer of names. Gardner. Yes, there you go. That's really all I had. I just thought, I thought it was sure. interesting that it came back again. So, like, I have lots of thoughts that I didn't write down about. Mike going through all of the history that we've been reading about in the interludes up Mm -hmm. to this point. I loved that. I I loved their reactions to it. But when he said that there had been nine kids killed, it's kind of Beverly's reaction that I had like two random thoughts on. On the first one is she said, well, I would have heard about, heard about it in the news. And I like the reference she makes on why, because she said, Oh, the castle rock murders and all those kids in Atlanta. Yeah. So I did some research. This stood up to me instantly, too. Go for it. Okay. The Castle Rock Murders refers to what happened in the book The Dead Zone, written by Stephen King. He likes to do that. He likes to throw yeah. in references to things. He's he's M- very much a reality. world builder. Mixed reality uh-huh. a little yes. bit. Yes. But the second one was an actual serial killer killing kids in the early 80s in Atlanta. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So that one is the one that stood out to me. I, I quickly, in my audible replay 25 seconds behind you know rewind 25 seconds like is that do they really just say that because Mm -hmm. timing wise from when we're recording this last week at work someone in my office that knows i like podcasts a friend of the show stephanie mentioned do you listen to real true crime podcasts at all it's like i've listened to a couple of the big ones like you know serial and s town and all these things and she's like all right there's one you really need to watch or listen to called atlanta monster and it's all about, you were probably too young for it at the time. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, there was a, a series of murders in Atlanta. These small, young black boys started showing up dead. This was last um, week. Yeah, I did, uh-huh. I did know and the then story. I'm reading this okay. chapter today. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, wait a second. <laughs> I would not have gotten this reference if, if I had read this a week ago. It's just so funny that it's like, you know, timing. Or maybe I would have. And just not realized it. But. Yes. See, right. I am the true crime pro- podcast guy, and I have heard of the Atlanta murders and everything. I just, I didn't put the connection together for timeline wise and all that, but that's pretty good. I figured the Castle Rock, that sounds like a Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a Stephen well, King I, town. But I'm saying, like, reading it, it sounds like a Stephen King town. So I'm like, okay, that's a Stephen King town. And uh, well, that's the big one, right? We've talked about that. Yes. That's, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and so, but like with the Atlanta thing, I kind of glazed over. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm sure there's probably some serial killer in Atlanta during the 80s or something. And I didn't realize that this is what they were actually talking was, about because I, I know so the exact. You know, and I went the tone, different but. way. I'm like, oh, Castle Rock. Well, that's a Stephen King thing. It might be a book I haven't read. Let me go look it up. I'm like, okay, well, which book did he kill off kids in Atlanta? Yeah, I didn't think it was real. I assumed it was another Stephen King book. I, I kind of figured, yeah, kind of along the same lines. Like he just picked a city and oh yeah, the, right. there's something going on or you know. And then part of me was like, why did he pick a city not in Maine? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, it, it gives it gives precedence to what no, I'm, no, I, I meant, like for a book, not like picking a real one. Right, 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 right. For it being a real one, it gives a lot of precedence to what Bev is saying because apparently it was a really, really well known thing. I mean, yeah. because my friend Stephanie at work, she was saying, yeah, this was like it was everywhere. It was huge, like all over the news. And this is before viral media, really. You know, there's yeah there's syndicated see? media, but it's not internet. Yeah, it's, style. And that brings me back to the second thing I thought about with Beverly's thought. Do you think in today's society with that much news coverage, something like this would actually get swept under the rug or be that big? I mean, with as oh, many gotcha. like shootings and shootings and cry, like it'd be a big deal for two have, days. Yeah. Right. It would like, go through, yeah, two to three days cy- and cycle. And, no one would remember. Yep. Well, and like serial killers. Which is scary in its own way. Yeah. Right. That's, that was there's, my point. So like serial killers are not, serial killers are not in the news as much anymore. I'm sure they still exist. But, you know, the lone gunman shooting spree is way bigger. Because with that, uh, because there's more body count typically with the shooting spree and all that. So it's more news wise, news coverage. You get that big impact. Boom. One time done. The serial killer thing, there was, hell, there was one, uh, a Netflix series uh, just came out not too long ago about the pizza delivery driver who had his head blown off with a bomb. Do you remember that story from about 10 years ago? Uh, Okay, pizza delivery driver uh, was told to go rob a bank, something trapped to his neck, and it ended up actually being a bomb, and it blew up on camera, live on TV, killed the guy. Well, Netflix actually went through and did a whole series on it and found this, you know, found the beginning, middle and end of this guy and of everything that led up to it. And it's one of those of I've never heard. How did I not hear that story being the true crime guy until a Netflix documentary? You know, so it's like because it doesn't get the promotion and doesn't get the. See, I remember the Unabomber. I remember Jeffrey. Dahmer. I like I remember those even before they were caught. I remember hearing about the stories. You don't even hear about. Yeah. You don't. You just don't hear about it as much, and that doesn't mean they're not there. I'm sure they are, oh, but yeah, no, absolutely. it's not as well publicized because it's not the sensational, big, giant. Every yeah, I don't know exactly. And I just didn't think. Like I kept thinking, well, if that happened now, no, we wouldn't have heard about it. No, because well, and even to the thought of the kids gone missing, not even just the murders, kids go missing. We live right next to a town that. In the last four years, over like 70 children have been reported missing, Mm -hmm. and it never gets made to the news or anything. Over 70 kids in three years have gone missing. Mostly girls. What's that? Mostly girls. A good chunk of girls. I mean, I think it's like a 70-30 split. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of it has been they get reported missing, they return, and the parents- a lot like what we've heard about in this book. Yeah, and and the parents just never call the cops to say, oh yeah, my kid came back, so they're still in the system is missing. But yeah. 70 missing kids on the books in three years. That's kind of unnerving, and you never hear about that. You know, so it's kind of one of those. I can understand, even in today's time, yeah, something like this town, maybe just, yeah, hitting the cycle for two days and going on. The problem I have with with this not being a thing in today's social media is mm-hmm. thousands of letters have gone in. They, they're talking about the mothers' groups walking kids to school and thousands of letters going in to figure out what can we do. Those people don't write letters anymore. No. Those people go to social media and make it a thing, yeah. and then it right. gains traction that way. If you have 3,000 people trending on a tweet, I mean, it, that's going to get picked up. It's going to get legs. It's going to be heard more than what's possible for dairy here. And comparative time in this story with the Atlanta murders, with the Castle Rock you know, massacre or whatever. It just doesn't make sense that this isn't getting out. It seems like the people are trying and it's just a dead zone. Yeah. Okay. I really like Mike going through and giving them the scoop on the cyclical nature of it and going through how, you know, he he mentions the black spot and he mentions 
the Kitchener Ironworks yeah. Easter Easter egg hunt, and I like Mike. <laughs> you know, he, he's just a, a such a, a cool character to have in the fact that mm-hmm. this is his part. He is the narrator. The gatekeeper. He he has this information, and he's doing his job. I just it's nice to see him. All of the work he's put in culminating here. This is exactly what Mike had to get to. And I just like seeing him in his element. Mike is one of my very favorite characters in the book. And I'm so glad we finally get to see him with the other people. As I've been going back and re-listening to some of our episodes, Luke just kept saying, well, I don't know how Mike fits. I don't know that Mike ever gets part of it. I don't I will, know I how say, the Mike. Even- I'm like... Here he is. He's with the people. I still so haven't excited. seen him with the kids, though. I, <laughs> I did okay. question that in the middle of this. I was like, I have to count this out, especially with the line that you mentioned of, well, all seven of us aren't here because Stan's not here. I was like, hmm, was Mike ever one of the seven? <laughs> I had to, I had to like, go through and count to make sure he was counting Mike in that. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe Mike's now becoming one of the losers. <laughs> Well, and I do think it's really interesting to introduce him to the group as an adult. Yeah. You're right. We haven't seen him with the kids. Right. So, but he is with them. So mm-hmm. just know, like they it know him good. at if, least. They're, they're, they piled, they piled around a bit. Well, and they, like there was even the line when Bill originally saw him, you know, when he got to the restaurant, he was like, part of me can see the, you know, he grew up nine more inches or whatever, but I can see the kid from. That we made late, that yes. we met late summer is what he said. Yes. I kind of want to go back to the idea of what you had said about dairy being kind of a dead zone Mm -hmm. where a lot of things happen and nobody really does anything. I really thought it was interesting. The point that Mike brought up about the town in Texas where it's like the opposite. Yeah. Due to the content of the water, it almost acted as like a relaxant, Mm -hmm. if you will. And so there was just significantly less crime there than anywhere else in the country. And that news gets out. The reverse (laughs) news gets out. (laughs) Well, oh, does it get out or did Mike go looking? My, yeah. Yeah, like, he, he did because he was he was been looking up stats and all these things to right. actually see if this is something true. I just think it's interesting the idea of that there's a reason that town is so calm. They they the scientists or whatever were able to determine the water had impacted it. Yeah. And the idea that dairy is the same on the far other end of the scale mm-hmm. and there is something impacting it. It impacts dairy in that negative way right via water <laughs> somehow yeah. or well like, kind of just, I mean, yeah. yeah somehow there's some kind of contagion or s- there's something going on with the water for sure not saying that oh they're drinking the water and they're hallucinating these things i'm not saying that at all but there's been a connection every single time to the the infrastructure of the water at yeah. least all right next thought my final thought on this section was the picture of georgie returning yeah. And that was a mind fuck. Like, oh, we knew it went missing. I thought it was just because you guys asked me, when are we going to see it again? Or yeah. when are we going to see it again? I never would have thought it would have been anything like this. Just this is, yeah, this is messed up. So almost 30 years later. Now, yeah. This craziness. was a picture of the picture, correct? It's, a, it's, it's like an evidence picture this was the evidence with the picture. picture of- no, the actual picture was at the crime scene. Right. But the, what they're showing in, right. the, yeah. the, I, I'm just, in the banquet hall is. But the a, actual picture was yeah. at yes. the crime scene. Yes. Interesting, you know, it shows up 27 years later. Which crime scene was it? Uh, anybody know? Uh, it was the one in the woods. In February, a boy named Dennis Torrio disappeared, a high school boy. His body was found in mid March in the Barrens, mutilated. This was nearby. And he took a photograph from the same pocket into which he had replaced the notebook. Can we just, like, go through all the kids who died? So we know about Adrian Mellon. And then it was, is there one before it? I should have written these all down, and I apologize (laughs) that I did not. So I'm going to flip through really quick. So we had Adrian Mellon, Lisa Albrecht, and Stephen Johnson in late 1984. Dennis Torrio, the high school boy in February. Then we had... Adam Adam Toro. Was he next? April 23rd, 16. Uh, You missed one. The body of Don Roy was found... Four days after the Torio boy. So Torio's boy found in March. Four days later was a girl, 13-year-old girl named Dawn who was decapitated. So then we skip a month, April 23rd. Adam Terralt, 16, um, also decapitated. 
May 6th, so two weeks later, Frederick Cohen, the two and a half year old who drowned in his own toilet, and that was, was a rough one. Flung against the wall, broken yeah, neck, bro- bro- and everything. It shattered a sliding glass shower door. Yeah, that's the one that got me. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Like you're not even safe in your own home. And like we kind of knew that with Beverly and the blood, but like I always took that as more of a like I'm just gonna mess with you. Yeah. But to actually kill him right there in his very own home, I took that one hard. Um then a week later on May, May 13th Jeffrey was Holly. Jeffrey Holly. I don't believe it says how old he was. Nine days after that, on May twenty second. Sad. That's my birthday. Uh, John Ferry was found dead at the house in Neibold Street. A yep. fifth grader. Yep. Both of his legs were gone. And that's where Eddie realizes, you know, remembers the house. Yep. That's where it hits him. And then the last one, another fifth grader found just off Kansas Street, right where Bill used to hide his bike. Right when they were in the Barrens, his name was Jerry Bellwood. Torn apart. What was left of him was found at the foot of the retaining wall. And then the thing found at the retaining wall. What was written in this boy's blood on the retaining wall was the reason Mike called them all. Come home. Come Come home. home. Come Come home. home. But yeah, like reading back on these now, these are all spots, or a lot of these spots are very close. I know Derry's a small town, but where Bill put his bike, the house on Neibold Street, in the Barrens, finding the boy there. This is, and then, yeah, this obvious sign from it, come home. Yeah, he's trying to tell Mike, I want you all. Mm-hmm. You know, I want you back. In, to, inviting them back, forcing them to keep. Yeah, he, yeah you know. he's come, he, he wants them there. And don't you feel like he is purposefully, especially the ones like found four days later, found a week later, found a week later. It was not that constant back in... 58 and yeah. I, I i have two questions either the kids in 58 got away better because we saw that all of our kids was able to evade or is it that it so desperately wants them back and he's so angry he she it is so angry that he is just like i'm gonna get them they're not here yet i'm gonna get another one i'm gonna get another one purposefully yeah. I, almost maniacally yeah, I, I kind of do think it's along those lines of he's pissed. He didn't get a finish, and we'll get into this uh, a li- little bit later, but he didn't get a finish. And so he got sucked back down, got put wherever he hangs out, and now he's back. And it's like, okay, now it's on. And I'm not having this you know, happen again. I'm getting them quick. I'm getting them as fast as I can. So I Revenge. Can, yeah, so I can finish my, you know, cycle. So... I agree with you completely that that's probably why they're coming so repeatedly, you know, rapidly. But I I was kind of chuckling, thinking that maybe he's just mad that the media isn't listening because all these people are all across the country. And he's like, I cannot be louder about this. I'm killing them as quick as I can. What else do you want from me? Make this national news. Make me go viral. Come on, bring it. I need my I need my losers club back here so I can finish them off. I'm writing you like. I'm writing Literally. half of these letters. Yep. That's so funny. <laughs> so we're going to move to part five of this section, or section five of this part, whatever we want to call it. And that is Richie gets beep beeped. I'm going to start with mine. First of all, I like how uh, it's Ben that is the one that came up with the beep. I always thought it was because of the trash mouth, like, a uh, oh, of trash trucks, beep, 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 you know, backing up, back up, Richie. No, it's about the Roadrunner. You know, I, I caught that line in there. He's like, yep, you're just a Roadrunner. Always running your mouth. Kind of thing, and I'm like, ah, okay, I, li- I didn't catch that. That's good. Yeah, so because I always thought they always called him Trash Mouth, so I assumed it was about the trash truck, but no, it's about the Roadrunner. All right, so it looks like we all have the exact same note. The similarities between the ones who left and how Mike's different. They all got money. That's the first one. Money, 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 money. So, any comments or thoughts on the money piece of it? Um, 11k a year, even by 1985 standards, is pretty damn low. For a small town like Derry, I mean, you, you might be able to live somewhat comfortably. I mean, I would probably put that at around maybe 35K in today's standards, if that. But for a single, for a bachelor, I mean, it's doable. It's not your piss poor broke right. or anything. It's just, it's not, you know, you're not living in the lap of luxury. But 
Mike there's did, no extra. Yeah, there's no extra. You, you get a reasonable house, you get, you know, whatever. But in a small town, you can make it go a little further than, say, in uh, a major city or anything. But Mike did his part to keep the watch, to main, you know, man the light tower, as they say. Yeah, I mean, from what we know about his lifestyle and what we know about his reaction to this whole thing is he doesn't care. Like, that's, that doesn't bother him at all. Like, he knows it's a sacrifice that he's making, but... It doesn't really bother him to not have the money because it's almost like it'd be a distraction to him from doing his part. All he does is spend hours and hours and hours every single day doing this research and trying to figure this stuff out. And so like the money would just almost be a detriment to his part to play here is how I think he feels about it. And he puts it on the table for them. He's like, let's just let's just say it. You guys have all done pretty well (laughs) and you know good on you that's that's great and i think it's richie that's like aren't you bitter and he's like no that has nothing to do with it i don't care and i just like mike he's he's just doing a good job and i'm sorry i'm gonna make a quick correction to what i said it'd be twenty five thousand by 2017 standards i feel like it's excellent i felt like 35 is too high (laughs) good thank you because i was going to and then i was like Nah. Yeah, I was going to. I was like, uh, my computer is too slow to <laughs> open up another tab. <laughs> I don't well, want to get just, to my Just notes. so you know, I'm looking at two different computers, and between the two of them, I have 17 tabs open already. So, yeah, I don't yeah. need any more. No, no, that's fine. I, I figured I needed to check myself Good job. on that. Yeah, I needed to check myself on that. So Good numbering. Yeah. I'm very proud. So, all right. So, the second point we both had, or all three of us had, uh, was the, the both children. of three of us the both of three of us uh, <laughs> never mind i take away the thumbs up <laughs> no. good numbering not so much with the talking <laughs> so the note that we had uh between the three of us was uh none of them had children and we get the stories of they're all kind of trying or nobody's putting up the goalie except for ben ben does say i'm careful i haven't i don't have any paternity suits coming up you know, that was I, funny. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, but everybody else kind of basically owning it up saying, yeah, we've tried and it just hasn't happened, hasn't been in our cards. And you know. I just want a quick shout out. I love Beverly's quick, just her real quick version and Bill's perspective of, oh, the greatest man in the world's refusing testing mm-hmm. can't be his problem. Mm-hmm. And I just it, it, it's such a like alpha male thing. Oh no, it can't be me. It's got to be something wrong with you, woman. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, there are men. I'm, and oh, yeah. I'm not saying either of you. It's not either of you. Look at me giving you props. <laughs> but there are men in the world who tend to think that way. But it really reminds me of the show Handmaid's Tale where there's a huge fertility issue, but they never blame any of the men, men about it. It's always well, the yeah, women. No, that fault. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, it's like the Henry VIII mentality mm-hmm. of, I want a son, I want a son, I want a son. And he married how many women to get a son? Uh-huh. And you would think after maybe the third, you'd start to think, eh, maybe it's not the women. <laughs> you know, it's kind of. Nope, not the perfect sperm. Yeah. Anyway, I, that that was my only like side note. On the kids thing, yeah. I thought Richie's story was kind of interesting. Um, I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on it, really. I just thought it was interesting the way that he tried to get, you know, fix tubes tied or whatever, and he's one in a million, another completely random draw that it didn't work. Yeah. And even with that, it proves that, like, you know, he was going bareback all this time thinking that he was, and it still didn't happen. It kind of doubles down on the fact that yeah none of you can have kids yeah like it's just not gonna happen no matter how hard you try or no matter how you don't try and it still forces his way to prove that it doesn't matter (laughs) right i will say so i read this book 20 years ago is that right i don't even remember it's been a long time and as i approach 40 vasectomies are very common among my peers and Richie's story is always in the back of my brain. <laughs> There's always that like, oh, you did, oh, great. Oh, you did, oh, great. Oh, we did, oh, great. Well, but you know, like, no matter what, I, yeah. I still always have that little like, but I read about it <laughs> in I a book. But I read about it in a book. <laughs> so it's right. gotta it be, must be true. It's gotta be true. Did you spend any time in the sewers? <laughs> <laughs> See? No, then that helps. But I'm just I was saying. Say, that's, like, a, that's a more sure shot, you know. <laughs> Contraceptive right. charm. 
I just it, like it just it's one of those weird things that has always stuck with me over yeah. the course of my life of oh you did okay I really hope it worked yeah <laughs> random <laughs> did you have uh, Luke I thought, yeah okay. yeah I got right. I have some thoughts on I thought Richie gets on. beeped still hey. so only specifically that summer is forgotten they only say about two weeks. Yeah, I mean, basically, I forget who's actually saying it, but I guess, I guess Mike. It's, is it Mike that says it? Yeah, Mike's like, I remember everything about that summer up until August 15th. That's right. And then nothing until September 4th, right when no, school. No, no, it wasn't August 15th. It was because it was the last day of school. No, it, I thought what he said. No, it was August uh, 15th. Okay. The other kids maybe are blocking that much, or and they're just starting to get flashes, but Mike okay. specifically remembers everything. Until that middle of August, okay. I, thought, I, I I just remember there being a last day of school reference in that in that same area, but I I could be off on that. I think you might be thinking first day when first day of school just started. Uh, that and then I maybe remember. that's what it was Cause Cause until yeah, the first day of school. Yeah, started. September fourth. Okay, 4th. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. that makes sense. But it's specifically just that short period of time that's being blocked out. I that's of Mike, and he's also a special case because we know he's stayed there and Mm -hmm. has retained a lot more and or forced himself to relearn some of this as well because that's his role in this. I just find that, again, really interesting about Mike. He's quickly becoming, I think, my favorite character. Ben is awesome. (laughs) Bill is awesome. I mean, a lot of them have really great qualities, but I I don't know. Right now, I've got a a special spot for Mike right now just because he he has seemed so separate from everything else, but... And he's definitely a special character because of his role, I guess. And we're getting a spotlight on what he's bringing to the table in this chapter, too. And I like that it has to be Big Bill that calls the question. Mike got them all here, but it has to be Bill to be the one to say, okay, you all know, you know, we're all at the same spot here now. We have the same information. Are we all still in? Are you in? Are you in? Are you in? And everyone seems to be in. Yeah, no, I do like that scene with very little or no hesitation. They're like, yeah, are we going to do it? Are we actually going to really kill him? Kill it? Yeah, let's do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and Mike asked Bill, like, do you still want to kill it? And this was, I think, a little bit earlier in the chapter. And Bill says, more than ever, because it's not just Georgie anymore. It's all of these other kids that they're just completely innocent and... They always will be completely innocent. Right. And having been a horror novelist that he is, I think he feels for it more because he's been in a lot of mental spaces of killing characters. I don't know. It just makes me think that he's a lot more attuned to the feelings of the people around because of, or maybe he's a novelist because he's more attuned to the feelings of the people around. I, uh, chicken and egg. All right, so we're going to move on to the final part of this uh, chapter, The Losers Get Desserts. I think me and Luke have the same note. Go ahead, Luke, I'll let you read off the desserts that they all open yeah. up from their fortune cookies. Yeah, so I was doing this very last minute, so I think I'm maybe off a little bit, but the fortune cookies start coming alive, whatever the fuck that was, turning into these little micro-terrors is what I kind of look at them as. Is Ooh, I like that term. And... Because it's almost like a diorama of, hey, it's a, a very, very localized <laughs> terror that that it can see them like is <laughs> being on display in shoe boxes in an elementary school hallway. <laughs> right. Sorry, so Bev's diorama of terror is blood. That's it's kind of all that comes out is this, I guess, ball of blood. It doesn't really describe it all that much. Yeah. Um, I felt like they maybe mentioned something else about it later that I. Could have missed, but uh, Eddie's was a cricket because he's got crickets in the basement. We learn about uh, Richie's was a human eyeball. Ben's was a set of bloody teeth that looked like it was something that was living in a gourd. I, I don't know if we got a description other than that, but it definitely sounded pretty gross. And Bill's was a mutant fly that kept growing and growing to be the size of a sparrow. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum's the fly. Life finds a way. Life finds a way, yeah. It, do you know the movie The Fly? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But he also said that he's been thinking about that a lot because he's writing a book about a mutant fly, too. But yeah. he did that based off the book The Fly. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I got that. Yeah. So I would just, just make it that. I note. liked the reference. Yeah. yeah. 
Another reference that has been worked into this novel has just been constant. Hey, yeah. How many pop culture references? Can Pretty you much. Get in here? Uh, and I, how many? That's what I like about Stephen King. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, Ben's, I think, I mean, and you can pick which each one's, you know, kind of, it, it, because it's it establishing fear and what you're afraid of. Richie with the eye, his eyes, he, was it, did he get surgery on it uh, or did just contacts? They were some contacts. kind of contact. Contacts. They were okay. like super specialized contacts yeah. though. But he's afraid of his eyes, afraid of going back to the glasses. Ben, teeth, he's afraid of eating. He doesn't want to be fat again. Beverly, the blood thing, I mean, because blood's just scary and... Well, because of what happened with Tom. And also, I was going... Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I was also going to go into that. But yeah, what happened with Tom with all the beatings and all that? Well, no, no, no. It says whenever she... Or she, did I, I mean, she, listen something? We actually jump into her perspective here oh, okay. for a, like a one paragraph. And this is one of my notes that I'm glad we got to. We jump into her perspective for a second because it's after she goes and throws up i think and then they meet back in the, like the lobby of mm-hmm. the of the the jade of the orient and she remembers back to yeah blood in general but also the bloody footprint after she cut her foot leaving yeah no. what's his tom yeah. yeah no and and i wasn't trying to say what i'd said the last time i was kind of trying to get into the blood but i forgot that she specifically mentions uh mm-hmm. Tom on that or uh, Eddie's cricket. That's just kind of lame. And Eddie's kind of lame. <laughs> you know? I mean, I you mean, know what though? I get it. Like as an adult and as a homeowner, things like that can just tick you off. Yeah. And he said that he's got all these down there and it's been keeping him up at night. And then he said he just, because it had been bothering him, he'd had a nightmare about it before. I, I get that. It's not that the cricket itself is scary. It's that it's been on his mind and then he had a nightmare. And so to me, that was, the best example of how these are not old fears. These are new fears, or at least like pulling out the scariest thing it can find immediately in their brain. Not that the cricket itself was scary or that the reason Bill was thinking about the fly was scary, but that those are the things that it could latch onto in their brains and then make scary really easily. My only other thought here is even though Eddie, or, or uh, sorry, Richie's micro terror turned into an eye, he still gets off a pretty good eye joke whenever um, Rose comes back in to see if everything's okay because <laughs> it was pretty loud when they all started screaming or whatever and she comes in and... Fortunes were good? Rose asked. Well, Richie said, I don't know about the others, but I for one got a real eyeful. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> just... Uh, as cool as the other side of the pillow. Just knock it out of a solid, <laughs> solid eye humor. <laughs> well done, Richie. Yeah. So, well, can we talk about Rose not noticing? <laughs> yes, like, what's up with please. That? Well, she's not one of them. It we've wasn't seen, meant for her to see. We've seen everyone that's not them or not the intended person not see these things. I mean, I agree with you, but how do you think Bill knew before she walked in that she wouldn't be able to see? Because he was like, dummy up, let's go and pull up the chairs. Because they've let's... had so much evidence, even from what I've seen, that no one else sees this. You know, it, okay. the parents don't see it. The other little kid couldn't see. Or I guess it was the kid that they were, they were playing baseball with. And they knew he wasn't one of the losers. Yeah. And he never would oh, be. Yeah. But I feel like there was something that happened in there that they he couldn't see, like, the blood or something. Um, I... I I need to read back through it, but yeah. I feel like there was also another kid. Yeah. yeah, but you're also talking like Beverly's father who didn't see. Yeah, blood like in the all of the parents are and... completely fucking oblivious. I know, but that was all back when they were kids, and I was just right. wondering. I, I just it was shocking to me that they could pull that memory back, or at least Bill like was like, "Oh nope, they're not dummy you up, know. dummy up." Yeah, it just didn't seem like a very grown up thing to think about, if Maybe. you will. Which is good that they're sort of starting to think in that terms of kid instinct again i suppose i've very much picked up in this chapter even more so than we have in recent chapters with the older like just the little bits we've had with the older characters they've all become a lot more childish when they're in this chapter here early on they're telling all the same jokes they quickly fall back into their same inside jokes and nicknames Mm -hmm. and all of these things and even we didn't mention it but richie accidentally goes into a muscle memory insult of Eddie. And he's yeah. like, I'm so sorry. That was so well, rude. Well, that, that was the second time 
because uh, the first time Eddie goes, "Don't call me Eds." I always hated it when you called me Eds, and, and, and says, don't pinch my cheeks, and don't pinch my cheeks. And Richie kind of stood back in shock, like, "Oh, like it kind of." But he didn't apologize. But then the second time when he said, "Oh yeah," Eddie gets off a good one with the aspirator. I think flipped. I think it was the when he got off with the aspirator is when Richie was like, "I'm sorry, Eddie." You know, I, I feel like he apologized before Eddie freaked out. Okay, Ma- I have no idea. I, yeah, but I'll, either way, either the way, fact but, that like. They're not controlling these things. Their natural habitat of this group is bringing them back to who they were as kids. They're yeah. making them exactly who they were in many ways. The stutters back. I mean, all all of these things. Yeah, and that Richie kinda... pushing up his invisible glasses. Right. There's yeah. been one, like, a couple of these things for every single one of them, and, and that kind of uh, ties into next note I have of uh, once Mike's job is done of getting them back together, he hands back the leadership role to Bill who naturally falls back into that position, just as he was when they were kids. It was, okay, here's what we need to do, or what do we need to do? Let's figure this out, and this is what we're going to do. And then Mike does offer up a plan of, okay, you need to take some time and figure out and try to remember. Go back to some place that can help jog it. Now, the thing is, if anybody's ever watched a horror movie... The rule number one of any horror movie is you don't split up. And you don't run upstairs. You don't go upstairs and you don't say, I'll be right back. I was going to say Matthew Lillard scream, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's I was going to throw it to you for that. I was thinking that. But, yep. you know, so, but it's kind of those two tied together of Bill and Mike saying, okay, fine, we're going to split up and we're going to come back, you know, together once we figure this all out. Maybe. Hopefully, I was going to say. Hopefully, we all come back and we'll figure this out and go from there. No, I think this next chapter is basically the last chapter in the book. They're all dead. <laughs> it's just going to be a the, bunch of like... The next set of chapters is just Pennywise killing a lot more people. We just, that's all we see. From Pennywise's perspective, it just says... It did, 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 it From the... South from the sewer. There you go. Autobiography of Pennywise the Clown. <laughs> the Dancing Clown. The Pennywise. Bob Gray. Bob Gray. <laughs> That's it for our recap of uh, this chapter. We're going to go into our questions for the new reader. Me and Melissa have a couple here. And actually, this one's for the group. This one's not just for Luke here. What would be in your cookie? I feel like I've answered this question before because on our Harry Potter podcast, <laughs> the podcast that must not be named, Pennywise is a fucking bogger. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is the thing that it thinks will scare you the most right now. Not like, a oh, your deepest, darkest fear ever. It's this is what's going to scare you right now. And I don't know. Like, it, for me, it, it's not something tangible like an eyeball. You yeah. know, like there's it's. One, I'm just so tough, you know, I'm just not scared. I'm not, I'm I not don't know what, anything, but uh, I call bullshit. Not not to jump in on yours, I don't know how mine would form, but I know what it would be if they could. Something to do with the heights. Like if you put like I don't know how you make it in fortune cookie micro terror form. Yeah, micro terror form. But if you could figure out a way micro to make me say ter- you have to climb at least eight <laughs> feet in the air, you know, yeah, that's gonna do it. I, I think maybe a mini ladder, you know, that could be like. Eh. See, I think that I love the idea of the mini terror. You guys are thinking too big. You're trying to think of what Pennywise, if he was there himself, would do to try and scare you. I'm thinking like. What are some of those random things that you've been thinking about lately that he could twist into something scary? I don't think about anything, so. <laughs> well, that's wrong. For Luke, it's going to be a podcast that doesn't go out on time, but I don't know how to make that up any terror. <laughs> I just see loading at the clock. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, no, or like a countdown time. time, a timer. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't see know, like the negative, the negative time yeah. counting up. <laughs> I actually have one. Okay. And it's not that it's necessarily that it's been scaring me, but it's definitely like, something that's been bothering my household is that we keep getting wasps in our house. Yes, you do. I, right. See, we've talked about it. <laughs> so again, not that I'm like scared of wasps or anything, but because yeah. that's been very current in my world, that would be something I could see Pennywise grasping and saying, pa wasp. I can make a giant wasp. Like that would make complete sense. Yeah. Based on what's been going on in my world lately. Okay. Now that's think true. of something like that for you. <sighs> I mean, grass. 
my my lawn is quite getting overgrown a bit, and I I could see <laughs> I've been dreading yeah, I mean, really, I've been dreading <laughs> having to cut that damn oh thing. Gosh. So like just a jungle growing out of it, and kind like of yeah, I, I, I grabbing see, like, you and twisting around. Yeah. See, there you go. Yeah. Now we're thinking. Yeah. All, right, all right, I can go with that. Wow. I don't again. I, you can't. I don't know how it would manifest, but water in the basement. If that fucking happens again. In this studio's down here. I'll be so <laughs> so yours would be a flood. Yours would just start a flood. I guess. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So there we go. Fair we, enough. We figured it out. Household household <laughs> problems that turn into micro terrors. Yeah. We're as lame as that. That's called home ownership. <laughs> All three of them are terror. God, we're boring. Okay. <laughs> hey, I did start with heights. I said mini I, ladder. You but, know. How about like dead had... child? That would be yeah. a pretty easy one. All right. All right, Molly. So here are my two questions, and it's not necessarily for luke it's for any because it's just things i was wondering there was a moment in there when they were talking about all of the train yard lands this is when he was talking to the cabbie yeah and he asked As oh dave, are th- the religious right guy. dave the religious guy pardon my french so he asks oh, are the train yards still there they're like yeah but nobody's been using them somebody tried to buy them but we can't figure out who owns them there was like some weird hang up with ownership of the lands so who owns the train lands? And who's really trying to buy them, too? It's all caught up in the courts. Yeah, no, I found that to be... Because I saw I saw your question down there mm-hmm. while I was reading through. I was like, I didn't catch that because I wanted to make sure I had an idea of what we were talking about. <laughs> I mean, I definitely couldn't think of like a, a guess of any characters that we've had that would be in the position to do that. I have a theory, which is why I'm asking. Okay. I think it's Pennywise. I mean, yeah, that's. I, I was definitely thinking because he wants to control as much well, because, as he can. But well, especially because if you think about the train yards, that's one of his territories. Mm-hmm. So, and if other things have been, I just or he's controlling the guy who owns. Just I feel like he's the one holding it up. I, I can know. definitely agree with that. When I first saw your question, that was like my gut reaction. Like looking into it, I I looked at your question mm-hmm. kind of backwards. I was like, who's trying to buy them? That's what I don't know. But this, what you're saying makes a lot more sense is he is making sure that no one buys that to take the trains away, to take the yeah. train yard away because it has to be there. It's industrial. It's it's one of his things. It's infrastructure. These are all things that he's been connected to in right. my very well-developed what is it <laughs> spreadsheet. And uh, I can I completely agree. That makes a lot of sense to me. And then my last question, and this is again to everybody. What is the significance of no one having kids? I do have a thought on this one. And again, this is no confirm. There's no confirmation to this. It's to make sure, and it's going to be weird, to make sure they have nothing to lose to come back. It's kind of like that mentality. It's a weird, you know, thing that either Pennywise or something else put into these. You have to come back and you might not make it back after you come back. So... I want you to not have a reason to not come back kind of thing. Like, I don't want you over, you know, saying, oh, I have kids now and, you know, I don't want to risk it. So I'm not coming. Nope. It's you're cut off to, you know, you're cut off Hmm. here. Yeah. Initially, I would think that it's not Pennywise, but whatever the pulling this group together force is, if, if that's like, I know we've kind of talked about that before of is there like a specific thing that it has to be this group is there a specific entity out there that's almost like the anti pennywise kind of thing that's pulling these guys together and making sure that hey this is this is the dream team right you know this is this is my 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 group that we've built and if they have kids there's a chance they won't come back but at the same time it could be pennywise doing a kind of flipping that same idea of if he somehow had that power, he doesn't want them to have kids because he wants them to come back. So it's whichever way it, it actually is or could be, having kids is a big reason to not have them come back. It's either one, the protectors, these guardians have to be here to save the city, or these are people that are mine. Pennywise has claimed them and needs them to come back for his own domination purposes. So I I completely agree with you. It's just funny that it kind of works yeah. exactly both ways. <laughs> yeah, in exactly it's, opposite reasons. Is it's kind of the I I would say story of Job kind of mentality of uh you know God and the devil have a a bet of how much can you put this guy through and have him still love you. 
kind of maybe not quite that to that level, but yeah, it could either be the God doing this or the devil doing this. Exactly. But in the same time, same results. Right. I had a completely different theory from you guys. Okay. I don't disagree with you, but my theory is a little different. So the whole point of them coming back and then coming together, it's sort of like reverting back to childhood, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about how when they all got together, they've reverted into their old jokes and inside they become things. The losers and, again. Okay. And then even Mike sending them off to do their own like exploration because it all started alone. It's they're really trying to get back into that mindset of when they were kids. And Bill even has a line in here that says if there are certain preconditions for the belief in magic that make it possible to use the magic, then maybe those preconditions will inevitably arrange themselves. Basically saying that you have to believe in magic in order for anything to accomplish this particular thing. And I strongly believe that parents don't have it. And my experience with this is I had kids before any of the rest of you guys did like significantly before any of my siblings did. And so you guys were, some of you were still in high school, some of you were older, but I had kids and nobody else did. And the divide between where I was in my life and all the rest of you, I don't, you may not have noticed it because y'all had each other, but like it was massive because I went from being one of the kids to having kids. And so it became less about how I see the world and more about how my kids see the world. And I just really noticed that as I became a parent and others didn't, that you still saw the world as this, and, and by no means do I mean this as an insult, but this selfish, like, oh, well, here are my parents and that's my family and I'm going to go do my thing. But once you guys started having kids and once my kids got older and there were more kids and it was, okay, I need to take care of this other person. And I need to, like, your focus shifts away from what you're doing to taking care of others. And so you lose some of that magic and you lose some of that sense of intuition and, you know, just letting it go. Okay, let's because just go see what happens. You have other obligations and duties that just cloud that yes. ability. Yeah. Yes. I agree. I, and I, I so not having kids leaves them more open to following their intuitions and, being open for that magic they may not it may still be really hard to get to but i bet if they had kids it may have been impossible mm -hmm. i can see that. so <laughs> so i it might be less about having kids to go back to and more about they have to be available mentally mm -hmm. yeah i can see that too i don't know that's no i mean that, I that, that's completely fair and i don't think you're off base with it at all Again, no, not, to, not, not, to, not to get into anything uh, spoilery. So, yeah, I think you're, you know, uh, you have good points. I think ours is a good uh, mentality of it, too. So we'll leave it at that. Let Listeners, if you have any thoughts, send us a tweet at floats down here and let us know how you feel about it. All right. Uh, we're going to go to our questions from the new reader. Uh, kind of your thoughts and everything. Uh, we really got to change the name of the section because I've never <laughs> really had questions. No. Like, I've got Nothing that's really put in question form that's answerable, yeah. you know, I, I, I think. Um, but I have a couple of Stan thoughts. Stan clearly seems to understand things a lot more than the others do consistently. He gets the phone call from Mike. It's almost like he remembered everything or enough of everything to just know, yeah, that's not for me. I'm out this time. And like no one else really had an inkling as to anything more than, oh, I remember Mike. Like, oh, yeah, I remember we had this thing. And I wonder if that has to do with Stan being the one that forced everyone to make the promise to come back and cut their hands and all these things. And we also know that Stan used his bird book and very effectively fought against his monster at the Stan pipe, the stand mm -hmm. pipe, not the Stan <laughs> pipe. But it's just interesting that he was... I think the only one that actually fought back, other than Mike, Mike did fight back against the giant bird, Rodan, by throwing rocks at it. And Mike is a special character, too. So I'm, I, I, everyone else was either able to escape or wasn't actually directly attacked. They just kind of witnessed something odd going on. Like, 
Ben didn't really get attacked. You know, he just saw the balloons floating against the wind and saw the the mummy out on the ice, right? So it's not really an attack. It's not like what Mike Corcoran went through, where it, this giant sea creature comes out of the out of the canal and drags him kicking and screaming to rips his head off. Like yeah. uh, none of them had it <laughs> that bad. Yeah. Right. Um, no, no, but I, Stan was the one that actually effectively fought back. Yeah. And I do have a theory on Stan and possibly on Mike. Knowing their two personalities, they probably wrote it down. Stan seems like the type to maybe keep a journal and he might have kept a journal during this time frame. And again, completely speculative or my own theory, but he possibly kept a, his own journal. That's why he never forgot. He had it written down and could go back and re-remember, like go back and reread, re-remember and know what was coming, what was going to happen because he wasn't ordered. He was a very, this is, you know, what happened today. This is the, the birds I saw. Cause he was a, he, he's an accountant. He's an accountant. He kept track of the birds he saw, kept track of his numbers. So, yeah, Just no, you bringing I, that up, I, that. I, I could see that Stan probably is the one that wrote everything down. Mike probably, and, and I would put it on Mike, might have written down some, but we would probably have heard about that by this point. So I'm going to say Mike probably didn't write it down, but I'm going to guess Stan probably did. And that's why he, when, it, when Mike gave the call, he made the choice he did. Maybe, think, except I think in the Stan chapter early on, it said he had picked up a book of bills and was reading it, but didn't like knew it was like, Oh, I, I think I knew this kid, but didn't really. Yeah. True. I don't know. Yeah. No, I agree. With you, but then that one piece always stands up. I'm like, but he didn't really know bill or, or he had only recently picked it up. Maybe that had just recently yeah. started coming back. Like it started coming back for him earlier because what is he in Atlanta? Mm-hmm. He would have been the closest other than maybe Beverly. Yeah. You know, no, Eddie. 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 Eddie's in New York. New York. So I was just thinking maybe he had some sort of like. Geographic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Literally. No, that's I fair. Because, right? you know, you're right. And I did forget about that. But again, maybe he didn't write about his friends. He just wrote about his experience. I, I know you would probably include your friends and all that, but I'm just spitballing. Yeah, I don't know. But maybe, I, maybe he does seem like somebody who would have all those kind of ducks in a row, doesn't he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I just his character intrigues me, especially again, like I said, we don't we don't get in his head, so it's it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, my final thought here is I can't wait to find out what the deadlights are because even well, I think it's Mike that's that says it right. The only thing he can remember in that two week period are the deadlights, mm-hmm. and that's all he says. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh. I wonder why that's the thing that he could remember. Yeah. So, and then Bill kind of just <gasps> the deadlights, you know, but they don't know. Yeah, it's like oh, yeah. that's it. Literary hook, right? All right, so we're going to move on to our favorite thing of this chapter. We will start with Luke. My favorite thing is a very well written line, and it says. If there are certain preconditions for the belief in magic that makes it possible to use the magic, then maybe those preconditions will inevitably arrange themselves. And I can't really add anything to what Melissa very astutely put it as earlier, but it it makes, I I like that line. It makes a lot of sense that, hey, if whatever this is that lines up that, that allows you to believe in magic is the same stuff that allows you to use it, then you'll probably actually be able to do it. I mean, it's just it's just a very interesting kind of concept of faith and how that allows things to happen and putting it in something that's actually interesting. Yeah. And applies to all of our other shows. So um, mine is, uh, I'm going to actually add in, uh, it's the story of Ben and the track coach and Richie and his defixing. You know, hit, hit both Ben and Richie's vasectomy. vasectomy. D vasectomy. That's what I'm trying to say. You can't pick uh, two favorite things. It's literally a favorite thing. Yeah. No, nope. Luke's a stickler. Pick one. Fine, Ben. Fine. Ben's story. It is. It's motivational and understanding, and I can totally see from his point of view how it was good for him and what he needed. But it's all on multiple facts, not just getting him skinny, but making him able to stand up to an adult, up to an authority figure, making him actually, and, and his mother, you know, not just the track coach, but to his mother as well. So that's why, yep, that gets my vote. 
My favorite thing was a line. And it really sums up the theme of this chapter of merging what you knew as kids into what you become as adults. And it says, maybe people don't really change as much as we think. Maybe they just stiffen up. Become less flexible, become less open, become less willing to let intuition guide you. Same person, just less free. I don't know. I like that I, idea. I, I completely disagree that that's a thing. That's me stiffening up. I'm getting no, in, inflexible on this. No, you don't. <laughs> you agree with me. You're I, just playing devil's advocate. I am. I'm playing sem- I semantic advocate. <laughs> <laughs> Make a joke. Oh, you're not funny. All right. I've been funny before. All right. Well, that will end our episode for today. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, Melissa? So really quick to all of our listeners, we really appreciate that you've been with us. And this was a fairly long chapter. It was more than 50 pages. Next chapter is 84 pages. So we decided to give you and us a break. So instead of making you read that giant chapter and in two weeks, we are going to go section by section. So make sure that if you're reading along with us, you only need to read the first section of the next chapter, and then we will keep you up to date from that point. And so follow us on Twitter at Floats Down Here. Send us an email at floatsdownhere at gmail.com. You can find us and our other shows at the podcastthat.com. Subscribe and rate us on iTunes. It does go a long way. Make sure you join our Patreon. Become a member of the Imaginary Legion today and you can sign up to help out support our show and all of our shows at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. So next time we'll be talking about chapter 11 title walking tours part one ben hanscom makes a withdrawal you'll float too. stay imaginary thanks